Hello, I'm Michael Sima, faculty director of the Lemelson MIT program. I uh, want to welcome everybody to our first virtual Eureka Fest. Like all of you, we, we wish we could have been together in Washington, D.C. for our first Eureka Fest there. But in these unprecedented times, uh, we're having to adapt. And despite the fact that we can't be together in person, we're thrilled to be able to celebrate together an outstanding group of young inventors and educators. And that's our high school invent teams and our collegiate student prize winners. The COVID-19 pandemic and the recent stark reminders that racism still persists in our society are both, of course, real challenges. I have, however, lived long enough to know that challenges bring opportunities. It seems like each generation has rediscovered the phrase, never let a good crisis go to waste. It's an obligation for each of us to look for those opportunities and to make the world a better place. I can say that the Lemelson MIT program has had to rethink or reinvent what we do because of the requirement for online engagement. It's an experiment that we never would have taken on without the crisis. In the process, we're discovering ways to reach a broader audience and do that more frequently than we've been able to do in the past. Is it as effective? Well, the jury's still out on that and we're keenly interested in the answer. It's moments like this that there are no better time to be an inventor. You know, pandemics and critical societal challenges have inspired inventions and innovations throughout history. Indeed, the last time uh, we had a great pandemic, the human immunodeficiency virus, HIV, it did just that. Note that the HIV epidemic resulted in 65 million infections worldwide, and probably more than that, and 25 million deaths. And out of that came an entirely new wave of antiviral therapies, all of which were inventions. And it grew out of that, you know, what could, which was absolutely a terrible tragedy of the AIDS epidemic. I'm confident that many of the learnings from that experience are going to help us get out of the current predicament. Invention is creativity at its best. In fact, it's said that creativity is intelligence having fun. There's nothing more fulfilling than creating something that solves important problems to benefit the world. And that's what we're here to celebrate tonight. In addition to the fact that this is our first virtual Eureka Fest, this year also is special because the Lemelson MIT program is celebrating its 25th anniversary. We began in 1995 with a very generous gift from Jerome and Dorothy Lemelson to bestow the first $500,000 Lemelson MIT prize, which celebrates the great inventors. Since then, we've had the privilege of supporting and celebrating hundreds of inventors from all races, both young and old, from grade school to high school, to college and beyond. Inventors who, whose aim has been to make the world a better place and have done just that through hard work and perseverance. And so we wanna thank you all for being here today to celebrate with us, to recognize the hard work of our 2020 Invent teams and student prize winners. We're very fortunate to have uh, a couple of special guests to join us. Andre Yakun is the understeck Yakun, who's the Undersecretary of Commerce for Intellectual Property and the Director of the USPTO, United States Patent Office and Trademark Office. We also have an important representative from the Lemelson Foundation joining us. It's Executive Director Carol Dahl. I want to thank you both for being with us to celebrate and share your thoughts on the importance of invention. And thank you to the Lemelson Foundation for its long support and dedication to the Lemelson MIT program and to MIT. We're very grateful to be a member of the MIT community and particularly proud to be part of the School of Engineering. And uh, now I wanna hang th hand things over to the Lemelson MIT program's executive director, Stephanie Couch, who began tonight's program. Here you go, Steph. 
Thank you. Well, welcome everyone. I'm happy to be your moderator for this very special event. Thank you so much for, for being here. This evening we'll hear from Lee Estabrooks and Tony Perry, our invention education team, who will introduce you to our high school inventors, the 2020 Invent Teams. Janelle Semecki, our awards program administrator, will talk a little bit about the student prize competition and she will introduce you to this year's winners. And as Michael mentioned, our special guest, Dr. Carol Dahl, Executive Director of the Lumelson Foundation and Andre Yonku, our Undersecretary of Commerce for Intellectual Property and Director of the United States Patent and Trademark Office. So now I'd like to introduce you to our Invention Education team who give their unwavering support and encouragement to the invent teams and the educators who work with each team. Lee Estabrooks is the invention education officer who manages all of our K-12 invention education initiatives and has been instrumental in the development of new programs. Tony Perry is the invention education coordinator who supports the invent teams and helps them work through the invention process. Good evening, everyone, and, and thank you, Stephanie. Um, it's, it's definitely my privilege this evening to share the work of our invent teams. The Lemelson MIT Programs Invent Team Initiative has been a national grants initiative for 16 years. 257 high school teams from around the country have conceptualized, designed, and built their own inventions. These teams represent nearly all of the 50 states. Students from all backgrounds have demonstrated what is possible through invention education. Um, tonight, it's my privilege to share the work of this year's invent teams. These teams represent our future. They applied their skills, talents, creativity, and empathy to tackle local manifestations of the world's most pressing issues. When schooling went remote this spring, their relentless optimism and persistence were assets as they transitioned to being distributed teams. They continued to invent. These young people will carry forward the confidence that they can tackle the biggest problems as they continue their education. To the Invent Team teachers and students who are watching, I want you to know just how proud I am of each of you. I look forward to following your invention journeys in the years ahead. So without further ado, it is my honor to introduce to you this year's Invent Teams. America's High School Invent Team is in the Socorro Independent School District in El Paso, Texas. Their educators are Francisco Nolasco and Elizabeth Mullins. The Baruch College Campus High School Invent Team is in the borough of Manhattan in New York City. Their educators are Jossie Foreman and Michelle Mistretta. The Billerica Memorial High School Invent Team is in Billerica, Massachusetts, here in Metro Boston. Their educator is Amy Scrobus, and their mentor is Florence Liu. The Bronx Cooperative Development Initiative is located in the Bronx, New York. Their educators are Maggie Tishman and Gessen Effie. The Colfax High School Invent Team in Colfax, California, is located on the edge of the Sierra Nevada range. Their educators are Jonathan Schwartz and Christian Kinsey. The Edward C. Reed High School Invent Team in Sparks, Nevada, is located just outside of Reno. Their educators are Lee Metcalf and Dustin Coley. The Francis Tuttle Technology Center Invent Team in Oklahoma City, Oklahoma, spans four campuses and four school districts. Their educators are Brad Sanders, Julie Smiley Foster, and Jared Keister. The Green On Local Schools Invent Team in Enon, Ohio, is just outside of Dayton. Their educators are Tom Jenkins, Jim Shaner, Kyle Brandy, Tina Harris, and Jen Tropp. The Gulfport High School Invent Team in Gulfport, Mississippi, is just one mile from the Gulf of Mexico. Their educators are Clint Brawley and Dr. Susan Bush. 
The Lower Brule High School Invent Team in Lower Brule, South Dakota is on the banks of the Missouri River and the Lower Brule Tribal Headquarters. Their educator is Devin Ryder. The Patricia A. Hannaford Career Center in Middlebury, Vermont is on the outskirts of the Champlain Valley. Their educators are Aaron Townsend, Kate LaRiviere, and Jackson Burnham. The Spanish River Community High School Invent Team in Boca Raton is located on the east coast of Florida. Their educator is Mary Fish. The Stockbridge High School Invent Team in rural Stockbridge, Michigan. Their educator is Bob Richards. And Williamston High School Invent Team is located in Williamston, Michigan, just outside of Lansing. Their educators are Joe Rasmus and Steve Kirsten. I hope that all of you at home are, are loud and cheering and applauding for each other and taking some time to celebrate all your accomplishments this evening. And with that, I will turn the conversation over to our Invention Education Officer, Dr. Lee Estabrooks, who has a few questions for our Invent teams. Thanks, Tony. I'd be happy to ask a couple of questions. Our first question is for Kevin and Chandler in Oklahoma City. Kevin and Chandler, your team's invention required information from multiple disciplines to be successful. Can you tell us how you worked across disciplines to create your prototype? Hi, so my name is Kevin and I'm from the Engineering Academy. Our team invented a system to disinfect airport security bins. So this project was a very collaborative effort between our engineering and bioscience academies and that all began during the brainstorming phase where we took input from both sides and we were able to continue that in the engineering side where we were able to do like the nitty gritty details with uh, drafting CAD models, ordering parts and ultimately constructing our solution. And afterwards, we were able to deliver that off to our bioscience academies where they were able to conduct experiments they created and return data, which we used as feedback, which would go into our second or refined model. And Chandler can talk about what they did in their academy. Hi, I'm Chandler Dean. I'm from the Francis Huddle Invent team. Uh, the bioscience for portion of the team, we first focus on demonstrating the need for the device by identifying pathogens on airport security bins. We were also able to test the effectiveness of the first prototype built by the engineers. Our tests with E. coli showed that the prototype killed most of the bacteria on the test plates. The bioscience team work supported the work of the engineers by showing the device is needed in airports and is effective at killing bacteria. Thank you, Kevin and Chandler. And our second question is for Jalacy in New York. Jalacy, physical distancing created a significant challenge for all of our invent teams as they continue to invent this spring. Can you talk a little bit about how your invent team has kept in touch how you've adjusted and how you've continued to invent during the pandemic. And tell us a little bit about what drives you all to keep going. Hello, my name is Jalacy Harad from the Bronx Cooperative Development, BCDI Invent Team. And we, develop, we developed a project called Guardian, which is a personal safety device which goes on the wrist in conjunction with an app and its use is to uh, prevent sexual assault and violence overall in the Bronx. So um, when this pandemic first started, uh, we were all really distraught because we all lived in different areas of the Bronx and it was really hard for us to actually meet. Um, but then we started uh, getting on Zoom calls twice a week and um, our program director, uh, Maggie Tishman, which is, uh, she's the um, program director for, um, for economic development at BCDI. She uh, would actually bike to our houses to give us the materials that we needed to uh, actually complete the project. So uh, for example, uh, we discovered this device called Flare, which was very similar in function to our device. Um, and it arrived at the lab in Fordham Road. So Maggie actually biked to my house to uh, drop off the device so that I could analyze it and see the differences and similarities between it and our device. So Maggie was definitely uh, played a big part in actually getting this uh, project done. Um, but as for our goals, um, it was more of um, it was more of uh, this project is much bigger than us. 
So um, we saw the statistics and we saw the numbers in the Bronx. Um, sexual assault uh, was actually, uh, has actually increased in the past year. So um, we wanted to make our community safer for everyone, not only just for us, but for, uh, for our future, for our, for our children's future. So um, it, was, it, was, it was not for us. It, it, was, it was for really everyone there in our community. And just, um, just uh, keeping that in mind, it really drove us to uh, finish this project. Thank you, students, and thank you, Jalacy, Kevin, Chandler, and to all of our students who work so tirelessly through an unbelievable school year that you continue to invent, and we really do appreciate that. And thank you all for being with us tonight at Eureka Fest. Stephanie, back to you. Great, thank you. I, I, I wanna add my thanks to all of you, um, not just for being here tonight, but for your persistence and following through uh, by staying focused on what your work is in the midst of these trying times and it, just a real inspiration. So congratulations to all of you. For people who wanna learn more about the different uh, high school inventors and their projects and their teachers, you can visit eurekafest.org to view the videos that the teams have made. So I encourage everyone to take a look and, and dive deeper on this um, really fantastic effort. So now let's move on to the next level of our young inventors, our collegiate level student prize winners. I'd like to introduce you all to Janelle Semecki, who manages the Limelson MIT Student Prize Program. Janelle has been influential in supporting and encouraging our collegiate prize winners throughout their application and award process. Uh, it's, it's quite a, a structured approach and it takes several months. So um, uh, thanks to Janelle for all of that work and to all of you for uh, sticking with us and going through the process. Thanks, Steph. As she mentioned, I'm Janelle Semecki, um, and I have the pleasure of managing our student prize. So even though, unfortunately, this year we could not all meet in person, it's really been such a wonderful experience getting to know our student prize winners virtually over the past few months and learning more about their projects. Uh, this year's winners are such an impressive group of students, and I'm truly amazed by how talented and motivated all of them are. And I believe you'll continue to see even more great achievements from them in the future. Uh, so just to provide you with some brief background, the Student Prize is a national competition with prizes awarded annually to graduate students and undergraduate teams who have technology-based inventions in each of our four broad categories. So the categories are Curate for inventions related to healthcare, Eat It for food, water, and agriculture, Move It for transportation and mobility, and Use It for consumer devices and products. Now, as the map on this next slide shows, this year we received just under 200 student prize applications representing 88 different schools across the country. So it was great to see that mix of schools. And then of those applicants, we awarded six total prizes given to three graduate students and three undergraduate teams. So I am now happy to introduce you to our 2020 student prize winners. Up first is our $15,000 Curate graduate winner from MIT, Shriya Srinivasan. Shriya's primary invention is the cutaneous mechanoneural interface, or CMI, which is a new type of surgical process for amputations. The CMI consists of a new composite tissue that is surgically connected to a skin flap in the residual limb and activated through an electrical stimulation system. This interface generates and transmits nerve signals that represent touch and vibratory sensation, thereby allowing the patient to actually sense what their prosthesis feels. Shreya also invented the regenerative agonist antagonist myoneural interface, which is a surgical technique that helps patients with prostheses gain better mobility and sense of body position. Up next is our $10,000 Curate undergraduate team winner from Johns Hopkins University, the Agio team made up of Siddharth Iyer, Jasmine Hu, Matthias Inslee, Diane Lee, and Eric Lin. The Agio team invented a solution to existing problems with the sur current surgical procedure to treat hemorrhages called embolization. 
The team created a new embolization device that is a sponge-like material using cryogel polymers to efficiently expand to fit a large range of blood vessels throughout the body. Their device provides an inexpensive and simple way to permanently stop a patient from bleeding internally. Up next is our $15,000 EDIT graduate winner from MIT, ZJ Tang. ZJ's primary invention is Synscoby, which is a special kind of tea mushroom that you can grow at home to create a smart filter that can detect and remove pollutants from water. ZJ also invented Depgos, which is a system that involves the safe deployment of engineered microbes for water quality monitoring. Next, we have our $10,000 Move It undergraduate team winner from Carthage College, the modal propellant gauging team made up of Celestine Ananda, Bennett Bartel, Nicholas Bartel, Cassandra Bassong, and Taylor Peterson. The Carthage College team invented the modal propellant gauging technology, which is a system that provides real-time and accurate fuel gauging for aircraft, particularly during dynamic events such as acceleration and changing direction, where the liquid often sloshes in the fuel tank. This technology can also be adapted for spacecraft, tankers, and other vessels that carry sloshing liquid fuel. Next, we have our $15,000 Use It graduate winner from New York University, Daniela Blanco. Daniela's primary invention is a greener chemical reactor, which is a machine that transforms a raw material into a usable product. Her reactor uses electricity rather than fossil fuel derived heat to produce materials such as nylon, resulting in more sustainable chemical processes. Daniela also invented an optimized system for clean energy storage and hydrogen production, which could be used in situations such as natural disasters when backup power is needed. And last but not least, we have our $10,000 Use It undergraduate team winner from Brigham Young University, the Neptune Plastics team made up of Mark Sacosta Rubio, Grant Christensen, and Hal Jones. The Neptune Plastics team invented a starch-based single-use plastic film that can be converted into packaging and shipping materials, such as single-use poly bags. Their plastic film is biodegradable, compostable, water-soluble, digestible by wildlife, and can be used as a fertilizer for soil after decomposition. While it looks, feels, and acts like petroleum-based plastic, it is 100% petroleum-free. So I'd just like to say congratulations to all of our 2020 Student Prize winners for their inspiring achievements. I'd also like to take the time to remind everyone that the 2021 Student Prize application is now open for submissions. So I encourage any interested applicants to go to our website for more details and to apply. Now at this point, Stephanie Couch will come back on to moderate some questions that we've compiled for the 2020 Student Prize winners. Okay, sure. So our first question that we had is for Celestine Ananda on the MPG team. Uh, Celestine, could you provide us with some more information as to what sparked the idea for your invention and how exactly you came up with wanting to solve this problem? Sure, yeah. So hi, my name is Celestine and I'm with the Modal Propellant Gauging Group. And we are developing a technology that provides real-time fuel gauging um, that eliminates the gauging errors introduced by existing technologies. And the reason that we're doing this is because, uh, well, it starts with that our group is filled with space geeks. Um, we all love NASA and we're really driven by a passion to do anything that we can to help humans get back to the moon and then onto Mars. Um, and we're looking into different barriers for deep space travel. And one of the biggest barriers is actually um, inaccurate fuel gauging. So we wanted to do, we wanted to try to figure out if we could determine a way using physics to solve this issue and develop a new way to accurately gauge fuel in zero gravity settings, as well as for aircraft, for when there's slashing, when the fluid sloshing due to banking or accelerations. Um, and so uh, a good example of this is that uh, a lot of people don't actually know, but Apollo 11 almost didn't happen. Um, so Buzz Aldrin and Neil Armstrong, when they were going to land on the moon, uh, the original location they were going to land had a large crater. Um, so they couldn't land there and they would have had to either abort the mission or continue even though they were really running low on fuel. And with that inaccurate fuel gauging, they didn't even really know how much fuel they had. Um, so when they landed, they only had 30 seconds of fuel left, but they could have easily ran out of fuel and they both could have crashed. Um, so that's a huge barrier for space travel. And then another jarring statistic um, is that planes crash nearly twice each week because they run out of fuel due to inaccurate gauging. 
So the multiple pollen gauging technology is able to accurately gauge fuel in zero gravity settings and for aircraft when they're slashing. Um, so that's kind of where we got our idea from. Um, and then we solved this all just with uh, fundamental physics concepts and uh, computer science. Terrific, thank you. Thank you so much. So our next question is for ZJ Tang. How long does it take before the smart filter biodegrades? Is there a certain number of water filtrations that it can go through before it starts to break down or does it last for a really long time? Hi, so this is a very great question. So the filter we built is actually grown from a, a SCOBY, which is a kombucha culture. So it's mainly made of bacterial cellulose. And bacterial cellulose is a little bit different from cellulose we extracted from plants like papers in a way that it has a higher crystallinity, meaning that the cellulose fibers are arranged in a highly ordered fashion. This makes our filter quite resistant to biodegradation actually. So I would imagine that our filter will be stuffed by impurities before it disintegrates. And in the literature, it's found that if you put this kind of like by uh, bacterial cellulose materials in the soil, where there are billions of microbes that attack the material, it will be degraded up to 20 to 25% after 30 days. So in our setup, which is in water, where the filter is much less challenged, I feel it can last for a few months at least without significant degradation. Thanks so much. Uh, the next question is for Marks Acosta Rubio from Neptune Plastics. I know you outlined the current use case for your invention, but do you also see this eventually being implemented for other capabilities beyond single use poly bags, such as multi use plastic bags? Yeah, absolutely. First, I just want to apologize if there's background noise. It seems like my roommate decided this was a good time to throw a brick into the dryer. Um, but um, yeah, so the under the idea is that uh, this is a very new technology, very much a frontier in terms of a direction that we can head. Um, so the reason that we chose single use poly bags is because the technical requirements for this specific product are very low. And so we can go to market and learn as much as possible about this material and just kind of keep moving forward. Um, and as uh, Scott Peterson, who's a mentor at, at BYU in terms of entrepreneurship, he says that you have to be obsessed with the problem, not the solution, right? And so as we continue to be obsessed with the single use plastic problem, um, we'll see where our technology will develop and where it can take us in terms of uh, the future of, of this, this kind of new, new idea. Um, and so, yeah, very much, it's very possible to head in that direction. Um, and we'll just have to see where, where it takes us. Great, all right. Our last question is for Daniela Blanco. And it's similar to the question that was asked earlier of the Francis uh, on an earlier question. So your chemical reactor invention also required knowledge across multiple disciplines to be successful. So could you tell us a bit more about how you worked across disciplines to create a prototype? Daniela. Yes, hi everyone. Um, in my case, I used machine learning to optimize and push the efficiency of my chemical reactors. And as you might imagine, machine learning is really not part of the common background for chemical engineers. So I was very new to it and a lot of people may say that I didn't really know what I was doing, which is true. <laughs> But, you know, we live in a time where there are a lot of wonderful resources. There were a lot of videos and books and articles out there. So I used all of that to start implementing the machine learning on my own. And it was an incredible addition to the reactors that we had. It truly was game changing for us. And now as a co-founder of a company that's trying to commercialize this technology, I am very much looking forward to start working with people from computer science and data science so that we can push this technology even forward and work together on it. I think that this experience taught me how sometimes the key to solve a problem in our field it actually relies on knowledge and resources that have been developed in a different field. So the sooner that we start working together and putting our knowledge together, the sooner we can get to solve all of those issues. Great, thank you so much. We keep trying to explain that inventing is transdisciplinary or very integrated. I think you've 
you've given great examples. So thank you so much. Um, and thank you to all of our Invent teams for submitting such great questions. Um, so congratulations, 2020 student prize winners. We couldn't be prouder. Uh, for people who want to learn more, again, please visit eurekafest.org to see the videos they produced about their inventions and, and learn more. Um, now, we're going to move on and hear from our first speaker. So uh, that would be Dr. Carol Dahl, again, the Executive Director of the Lemelson Foundation. With a background in discovery sciences, innovation programs, and global health and development, Dr. Dahl leads the foundation's work on cultivating impact inventors and supporting systems that allow invention-based businesses to thrive. Prior to joining the foundation, Carol was founding director of the Global Health Discovery Program at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, where she led the development of grand challenges in global health and grand challenges explorations. Previously, Carol served as Vice President for Strategic Partnerships at a startup diagnostics company. And from 1990 to 2001, she worked at the U.S. National Institutes of Health in several capacities, including the founding director of the Office of Technology and Industrial Relations at the National Cancer Institute and program director at the National Center for Human Genome Research. Carol has received numerous accolades for her work. She received her bachelor's degree from the University of Iowa and a master's and doctoral degrees from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. So welcome, Carol. Thank you, Stephanie. It's really great to be here virtually with all of you student inventors today and your parents, teachers, advisors, and others in your respective communities who have supported you along your invention journey. I want to congratulate all of you on your accomplishments this year, which are even more impressive given the disruption caused by the pandemic. Uh, we heard a great story about that a moment ago. I imagine it would have been easy for you all to have set your work aside and leave the work unfinished before school closed, but your passion, your commitment to work through adversity is truly reflective of your inventor spirit. You all embody what um, our founder, Jerry Lemelson's vision, uh, was of what it means to be an inventor. It's remarkable that you've all accomplished so much this year and what excites us at the Lemelson Foundation and our partners at the Lemelson MIT program. Our mission is to improve lives through invention. And that starts with our commitment to ensuring that there's a future generation of inventors such as you and that you thrive. So we support programs that give students the chance to experience invention discover their passion for seeing and solving problems just as you've done, and also to feel empowered to continue to be agents of change throughout the rest of your lives. Which brings me to the story of the Lemelson Foundation and Jerry Lemelson and our partnership with the Lemelson MIT program. The foundation was established by Jerry and Dolly Lemelson over 25 years ago with the mission to improve lives through invention. Jerry, who was a true visionary, and one of the most prolific independent inventors of the last century with over 600 patents to his name, launched the foundation um, in order to recognize the importance of invention to both the US economy, but also to meeting social needs. In launching the foundation, Jerry and Dolly committed to supporting future generations of inventors so their ideas could be nurtured and translate into business opportunity and products that would improve people's lives. Our partnership with the Lemelson MIT program began 25 years ago as well, which tells you how core the work of the Lemelson MIT program is to Jerry's original vision and also the work of the foundation and our mission. I know it's a strange time for all of us right now, and I hope that you and your families have been safe and well these past few months. I would normally take time to convince you that invention is important and that it's relevant to your daily lives. But ironically, the coronavirus pandemic has really put a spotlight on the role of invention, at least when it comes to addressing healthcare challenges. Think of the modern day inventions we're now seeing in the headlines every day, ventilators, personal protective gear to protect our healthcare workers and, vac and vaccines, just to name a few. 
It really drives home the point that inventions are key to addressing our challenges of today, but also of tomorrow. Invention is also a catalyst for economic growth, good jobs and better lives. Invention is essential to what we want for the future. And we at the foundation believe we need people prepared to invent and systems to support them to make that a reality. That's why we're so passionate about the work you're doing and our work to grow the field of invention education, which is what Lemelson MIT has really become a cornerstone for. All of you are here today to celebrate your invent team's accomplishments or collegiate inventions, and you're all living proof of the impact of having hands-on invention experiences. We've heard from so many invent team students over the years that the experience changes their lives, that students feel empowered by the opportunity to choose a problem that's meaningful to them, find a passion using the practical application of STEM and business skills, and embrace the skill sets and mindsets that will enable them to tr thrive in the future economy and the jobs of tomorrow. We're also incredibly excited about celebrating the young inventors we have here today that have won the Lummelson MIT Student Prize. You have taken daunting, real problems and used your ingenuity and persistence to create inventions that will become solutions and products with big impact. You're an inspiration to all of us here today but also to the students that follow in your footsteps. I just wanna say how incredibly impressed I am by all of the inventors here today. It's just a treat to be in this virtual room together with you and to see the work that you've done. You are all the change makers of today, but I also see you as the leaders of tomorrow. Congratulations. And now to our special guest speaker, we are thrilled to have Andre Yonku with us to share his thoughts and experience. In his role as the Undersecretary of Commerce for Intellectual Property and Director of the United States Patent and Trademark Office, Dr. Yonku provides leadership and oversight to one of the largest intellectual property offices in the entire world. He also serves as the Principal Advisor to the Secretary of Commerce on Domestic and International Intellectual Property Matters. Prior to joining the USPTO, Mr. Yonka was the managing partner at Irela Manila LLP, where his practice focused on intellectual property litigation. Mr. Yonka appeared in a variety of high profile matters in front of the USPTO, U.S. District Courts, the Court of Appeals for the Federal Circuit Court, and the U.S. International Trade Commission. Director Yonko has also taught patent law at the UCLA School of Law and has written and spoken publicly on a variety of intellectual property issues. Prior to his legal career, Dr. Yonko was an engineer at Hughes Aircraft Company. I just love that. So hopefully we hear more about how an engineer gets to, to be uh, so prominent in law. So throughout his career, Dr. Yonku has received many accolades from organizations and publications. He holds a Juris Doctor from the UCLA School of Law. He also has a Master's of Science in Mechanical Engineering and a Bachelor of Science in Aerospace Engineering, both from UCLA. So welcome, Director Yonko. Well, thank you uh, so much for that uh, very kind introduction, Stephanie. And uh, it's an honor and a pleasure to be here with uh, all of you. Uh, it really is uh, so impressive uh, what you have all done. Uh, the student prize winners uh, that I have seen and heard about and the invent teams have done amazing work uh, and it's a true inspiration. Um, and uh, really, as uh, the head of, head of the uh, Patent and Trademark Office, I want to welcome all of you to the innovation community. Um, and uh, hopefully, you'll turn some of these inventions into patents, uh, or at least uh, you'll apply for some of them and uh, see where all that takes you. You know, uh, from uh, Thomas Edison to Steve Jobs, from the Wright brothers to Stephanie Qualick, the American tradition of innovation has enriched our lives and solved problems. Backed by our patent system, American ingenuity has been at the forefront of every major scientific and technological revolution. As a result, the tremendous progress 
we take for granted today sometimes has mostly been made over the past 200 years and mostly with American innovation. And though lots of factors have gone into that success, I believe that the uniquely important and history-defining factor is actually the most important invention of them all, the United States Constitution, and the inclusion in it of intellectual property rights. For the Constitution itself in Article 1, Section 8, Clause 8, gives Congress the power to promote the progress of science and useful arts by securing for a limited time to authors and inventors the exclusive right to their, in, to their respective writings and discoveries. And since those words were written, our constitutional patent system has given rise to a spark of ingenuity and development, the magnitude of which humanity has never before known anywhere in the world or at, or at any time in history. And now that you are inventors too, you are a crucial part of this system because you represent the future. Your generation of inventors will go on to invent things that we can barely dream of today. I can't wait to see what you'll achieve in the future beyond the amazing achievements you already have to date. You in, in particular, I'm sure realize that people of any age can invent. In fact, Anyone, no matter their age, gender, race, or background, can be an inventor. All you need is an idea. To truly advance, to truly advance innovation and human progress, we must all work to broaden the innovation community and make sure that everyone knows that they too can change the world through the power of a single idea. We must identify appropriate role models for young people to excite them about, fu the, the, uh, about the fut a future in science, engineering, and technology. And we must identify mentors to guide budding inventors. So role models and mentors. I am certain that you all have had role models and mentors along the way, and in turn, you will also be a role model and a mentor to others. So don't be shy about boasting that you are an inventor. You never know who you can inspire. And why is this so important? Why do we need, do we need to inspire even more people to become inventors? Take, for example, women inventors. Women constitute about half of the population of the United States and about half of the American workforce. And yet, women's participation in STEM jobs and the IP system lags far behind their male counterparts. In the United States, less than 25% of the STEM workforce are women. And the participation of women as inventors named on US patents is even lower. Indeed, the overall US women inventor rate in recent years has been around 12%. Although as disappointing as these numbers are, and they truly are, they do point to significant potential for the United States. A Harvard study found recently that increasing invention rates among women, minorities, and those from low-income communities can up to quadruple the rate of U.S. innovation. So I say, let's do that. We must start early. We should never forget that the wonder of discovery and the thirst for innovation begins at a young age, and it should be encouraged and developed before it is too late. And perhaps you in this group know that better than anybody else. We should also not forget the very real economic benefits of innovation. For example, intellectual property intensive industries directly and indirectly support about one third of all U.S. employment and about 40% of the total U.S. gross domestic product, our GDP. And importantly, workers in IP-intensive industries earn an average wage that is almost 50% higher than wages in other industries. 
The bottom line is that in today's highly competitive global economy, it is increasingly important to ensure that all Americans who are willing to work hard, persevere, and take risks have the opportunity to invent, to start new companies, succeed in established companies, and ultimately to achieve the American dream. In other words, we need all hands on deck. The good news is that you, folks in this meeting, you are all on deck already, and we need to hear your stories. Just like all inventors, I am sure each of you has a story about your own personal journey, some of which we have already heard, and how you developed your invention. And I am sure that each of your stories include the story of perseverance. As Thomas Edison famously said, quote, I have not failed. I have just found 10,000 ways that won't work. You know the saying, necessity is the mother of invention. Well, true, I agree. But I also add that if that's true, perseverance must be the father of invention. So when you share your story, don't skim on the failure and the resulting perseverance needed to get to your successes. By sharing your story of perseverance and trying your best, even when your success is not guaranteed, you can inspire others to keep trying and keep going as well. And I hope you remember that as well and continue to persevere in working towards your own dreams because that trait will take you far in life. It already has. So I want to thank you for everything you have done and all the amazing work you have done, and especially thank you for what I'm sure, so much great and amazing work to come. And I want to thank you for inviting me to speak here today. I know that there is a few questions coming up and I look forward to answering those questions in a minute. But now I understand we're going to honor some high school inventees who have been issued patents. So let me be the first to congratulate you on this incredible achievement. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you so much. We are planning on questions and answers, but first, uh, Lee, I think you have some uh, special uh, special announcements for us. I sure do, Stephanie. Thank you, Dr. Dahl and Director Yanku for inspiring and encouraging our young inventors. It's my pleasure to now announce three former invent teams who have received U.S. patents since our last Eureka Fest. Thor High School Invent Team received their second patent in January. Both of their invent teams have now received a U.S. patent. Congratulations to the inventors, who include teacher Rachel Tebow. Rachel led both of the invent teams at the Early College High School as an extracurricular activity. I'd also like to acknowledge and thank patent attorney Adam Stevenson of Tempe, Arizona. Adam provided pro bono legal assistance to both of SOAR high school infant teams. Well done, everyone. Our next patent was issued to the Poolsville High School Invent Team. Congratulations. This team also invented as an extracurricular activity. Teacher Jack Stansbury worked tirelessly with the team all the way through the patent process. Thanks, Jack. I know you're out there. The pro bono legal assistance for the Poolsville Invent Team was through Microsoft's Make What's Next program to inspire girls to pursue STEM and change the world for the better. And our third Invent Team has been notified of their patent number. Officially, it will issue next week. However, we want to celebrate the Stockbridge High School Invent Team today as they are also a current Invent Team. We actually have one student on the current infant team who was a ninth grader on their first infant team and is now a graduating senior. Congratulations, Sylvia Witt. A big thanks goes out to teacher Bob Richards for his support of the infant teams, as well as invention education within his rural district in Michigan. The Stockbridge High School infant team also received pro bono legal assistance from Microsoft's Make What's Next program. Congratulations to all of our patented inventors. 
And a final big thank you to their teachers, Rachel, Jack, and Bob, as well as to Adam Stevenson and Microsoft. Back to you, Steph. Thank you, Lee. I, I just love it when we hear these stories about uh, this wonderful level of success. We don't expect patents from all of our teams, but we have had 11 patents so far, and uh, it's just really a wonderful milestone. So, so congratulations to you teams. Um, all right, now we're gonna open up the conversation and take some questions from our Lumelson MIT Student Prize winners for Director Yonku and Dr. Dahl. And the first question comes to us from Daniela Blanco, our Use It graduate winner from New York University. Daniela? Yes, hi, I have a question for Director Yanku. Um, the Success Act report addresses the fact that there is a serious lack of diversity in patent holders in the US. Some of this problem is caused on itself by the serious diversity challenge that we have in the fields of engineering and technology, which generates a greater number of patents than other fields. So what are some of the ways that the USPTO is trying to address the need for greater diversity? Uh, first of all, thanks, Daniela, for a very good question. And um, I addressed some of this in my opening remarks. Um, for the audience, the Success Act is a congressional act that has uh, a number of things in it, but uh, one of the things is uh, that it asks the U.S. Uh, Patent and Trademark Office to submit the report with some information and proposals regarding uh, increasing the diversity of, uh, of patent holders in the United States. Um, and um, you can look on our website at uspto.gov to uh, see that report from October of 2019, um, or you can look um, uh, it's available elsewhere in the, uh, on the internet as well. Um, but um, the USPTO has uh, long worked uh, in this area, and it's an area of uh, significant importance for me that uh, we have focused on since I've been uh, the director. Um, the key is that we must broaden our intellectual property, our innovation, our entrepreneurship ecosystems demographically, geographically and economically. So what are some of the things that we're doing? Um, well, um, as an agency at the USPTO, we have undertaken taken proactive uh, measures to encourage women, minorities, veterans, and others to innovate and to secure patents uh, to protect uh, those inventions. In the report itself, you'll see um, um, almost a dozen uh, of our existing programs. For example, our annual Invention Con and uh, Women's Entrepreneurship uh, Symposium, um, our support for pro bono networks around the country, pro se assistance to health inventors who do not have legal representation um, uh, and the like. Um, and um, we also identify in the report a whole host of ways to build on existing USPTO programs with even more initiatives. Um, most recently, we launched on our website um, a, a page that we call the uh, Expanding Innovation Hub. Uh, so if you go to our website, again, uspto.gov, you'll see a ribbon um, in the top half, and one of the buttons is for this hub. You click on that, and it'll take you there. Uh, it's an online platform. Um, that provides resources for inventors and practitioners to encourage greater participation in the patent system. Um, and it collects a whole host of resources there. And the following is something that I believe is really important and can really um, move the needle on this issue. Um, we are forming a council for expanding American innovation. This will be a group of leaders from um, uh, from academia, from government, and from industry, um, and from a cross-section uh, of industry. And uh, the folks on, the, um, uh, on this council will be at the highest levels of their uh, institutions, uh, for example, uh, example, some CEOs from major corporations, university presidents, uh, leaders from other organizations uh, and government agencies. The 
key outcome of the council will be to generate um, a document with a national strategy uh, that um, uh, the United States can uh, implement, um, hopefully, and encourage the participation of uh, traditionally underrepresented groups um, as inventor, patentees, entrepreneurs, innovation leaders, uh, and the like. So um, thanks again for that uh, important question. It really is one of the most important issues, uh, in my opinion, uh, for the United States, for the United States economy. Thank you so much. The next question comes from ZJ Tang, the EDIT graduate winner from MIT. And this question's for Dr. Dahl. Hi, Dr. Dahl. Can you talk about some of the ways the foundation and its grantees have been helping to support young inventors and the educators who help bring them along? Yeah, great. Thank you, ZJ. Thank you for the question. Um, First of all, I should say the foundation is really committed to seeing more people like you taking ownership of problems and creating great solutions and, and taking that on. You have incredible potential to make change for the future. So we focus on four things that I really think are key. The first is that we support experiences for uh, youth to actually be inspired to recognize they have the potential to invent. And so, for example, we support um, the Lummelson Center at the, at the Smithsonian, which is for the study of invention and innovation. So all of those of you who have a chance in the future to go to the National Museum of American History uh, should visit the Lummelson Center. But their kids of all ages have their first invention experience and learn about how invention has changed our world for the better. The second thing we do is we support students themselves in actually experiencing invention through programs like Lummelson MIT Invent Teams, MESA, the Invention Convention, and other similar programs, a real immersive experience in inventing. Third, we do provide assistance to support uh, those programs in terms of assisting educators, people like the teachers of the Invent Teams here today, to prepare for the invention experience and how to bring that to their students, whether it's inside or outside of the classroom. And then finally, fourth, we celebrate and highlight the achievements of young inventors like yourself. Um, so others will see how important it is for students to experience invention and also see how impactful those inventions can be on uh, the communities around them. And that's part of why we're here today, obviously to celebrate the work of the student prize winners as well as the invent teams and their accomplishments. But we also know that we're, we can't do it alone. And in fact, um, all of you are an important part of that effort. So I wanna encourage all of you who are here today who are student inventors, whether you be at the collegiate level or the high school level, um, that you actually are the best spokespeople on behalf of student inventors. And so I would really deeply encourage you to use your own voices tell your own story of your invention journey and also how the experience has changed your life and what you might want to do in the future. All right, Taylor Peterson, who was with the Move It undergraduate team from Carthage College has a question for Director Yonko. Hi, so your bachelor's degree was in aerospace engineering and your master's degree was in mechanical engineering. Then you ended up graduating from UCLA Law School and teaching patent law. Engineering and law seem like two different career paths. Uh, can you talk a little bit about how the two go together and would you recommend perhaps to students? I think your last, uh, th thanks for the question, Taylor. I think your last question was, do I recommend this path to students? And the answer is, I'm a little biased, of course, and the answer is, uh, Yes, I recommend it, if it is a subject you like. Um, but your main question was, um, how do the uh, two go together? I think uh, uh, that was your main question. And um, uh, the truth is that there is more overlap uh, than you think. Uh, both require creativity, analytical thinking, and problem solving. Um, there are lots of similarities, um, frankly, especially if you go into patent law. And uh, I don't think it's a coincidence that uh, engineering students um, often do uh, very well in, um, in law school. Um, especially as a patent lawyer, you know, um, 
what, what, what you get to do is you get to work with a lot of inventors uh, in many different fields. And you not only help them uh, uh, get protection for, their, um, uh, for what they have created, but you get to be a teacher as well. You get to first learn and understand what they came up with, and then you get to explain it to others. You explain it either to the folks at the patent office to convince them to grant the patent, or you explain it to a judge and jury um, uh, when, uh, in case of, uh, of a patent infringement case. Um, and you're working with the most brilliant minds out there, some of the most exciting technologies out there. You get to use your technical background um, and um, uh, in, 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 in not just uh, uh, in, in one area, but in a whole diversity of, uh, of fields. And um, it's a super interesting profession, but as I said, you have to like it. Uh, just as an aside, you know, I didn't go to law school right away. I worked as an engineer, but some of my friends uh, went to law school before I did. And, um, you know, I was just, I was, I was a through, an engineer through and through. So one of my questions for, the, um, for my friends who had already gone to law school, I said, by the way, do you like it? Yes, I like law school. And um, do you have to uh, read a lot? And do you have to write a lot? Because, you know, coming from engineering school, at least for me back then, it was, those things were like, Ugh. and he says, are you kidding? That's all you do. Um, but uh, bottom line is you, you do have to write to read and write. Um, uh, but it's a combination of all those things because you put them together with the technology and the people skills. Um, and uh, it really is a wonderfully rewarding career um, if, uh, if you're interested in those things. Thank you. Our next question is from Siddharth Ayer, our Curate undergraduate team winner on the AGEO team from John Hopkins University. Hi. Uh, so my question is to Dr. Dahl. Uh, Dr. Dahl, before becoming executive director of the Lemelson Foundation, you were a leader in global health with the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. You've also worked with the U.S. National Institutes of Health. So could you please uh, share your perspectives on the role of invention now and also in the years ahead? Great, thank you for giving me a wonderful question, actually. Uh, I think invention is absolutely critical to our lives today, but always will be, frankly, into the future. Uh, when you think about the quality of life we have in this country, it's largely due to the benefits of invention, whether it's able to keep your, you know, that you're able to keep your food cold in a refrigerator so it doesn't spoil as quickly to having you know uh, cars to drive the way we have electricity in our homes and the the full range of things that that enables us to do all of these are a result of invention um, but there's still a lot of things to be done so i don't think we've done what we need to do i think there's a lot more we need to solve create inventions that will actually solve big problems and i can think of a few of them right off the top of my head that sit in the headlines every day, you know, creating renewable energy, addressing things like carbon capture and reuse so we can address the issues of climate change or creating effective vaccines and drugs to meet the challenges of the coronavirus and the next thing that will come to us in terms of our own health. So there are things to be done that are big challenges as well as some simple things that simply make our lives easier. And I think inventors are really needed for all of that. And I think great examples are coming from our invent teams here today, as well as our student prize winners who have uh, tackled some really challenging problems. But I wanna comment that there are also communities around the world who don't have access to those things. And I think you know those of us who have grown up here in the United States are incredibly privileged and we sometimes don't realize that. There are communities out there who don't have the same quality of life, whether it's a refrigerator or a car, or access to electricity, or even frankly, a toilet. Um, so we have to realize that there are about 2.4 billion people, a third of the world's population who don't have access to toilets and about a billion people who don't have access to electricity around the world. And that's astounding. We need to invent solutions for them as well which means ones that they can afford, but also that work in the communities they're in and the settings they're in. 
So invention is needed to solve a lot of problems. We also have to recognize, as I think Director Yanku pointed out really well, um, invention's part of the economy. It's what's made the US economy strong. It is the envy of economies around the world and that we need to continue to invent to create the businesses that create new products that address our needs and allow our, our economics to actually be strong. So invention is needed here and in other countries for, for economics. So the one thing I'm gonna add is that I think, you know, all of those things I kind of knew before I came in this job because of the things I'd done in the past, but the thing that's kind of taken me by surprise and that I've learned over the past nine years here at the Lummelson Foundation is that the act of inventing is also incredibly important for individual people. I see that in the students who are exposed to invention through the programs, such as the ones we're talking about today, invent teams, also from people like yourselves who are student prize winners this year who are already inventing. The actual experience of inventing seems to transform people so that they feel empowered to actually make change in their own lives and in the communities around them. It also is an opportunity where people cultivate their skills, things like empathy, communication skills, creativity, and persistence that are coveted, frankly, by every single employer out there looking to hire the talent as they grow their companies. So my impression is not only do we need invention, but individuals need to experience an invention. And that's why I'm, I'm super excited about the programs we're talking about today but also super excited about all of you because I see that the experience of invention positions you well to be the leaders of tomorrow. And I hope that we have an opportunity and I think I share this with Director Yanku. I hope we have the opportunity to actually expose all students to the potential that they have through the experience of invention through their educational pathway. Carol, I, I thank you for these comments, especially the, the last few things you said about the personal value to, to the young inventors' lives who go through this year-long process um, and for student prize winners, sometimes more than a year. Um, and you know what we know after doing this kind of work with educators across the U.S. Uh, for 16 years is that many of the teachers we work with go on to find ways to put classes, formal classes into their schools so that more young people get the opportunity as part of the regular school day. So a shout out to the many teachers who've now joined this, if you will, movement. And uh, we couldn't, couldn't have that network of teachers, of course, without you and the foundation. So, so thanks for valuing this. Um, our next question comes from Marks Acosta Rubio, who's the uh, use it undergraduate team winner from Neptune Plastics uh, at Brigham Young University. And Carol, this is another question for you. So, uh, Marks. Awesome. Yeah. Uh, so, Dr. Dahl, today we've heard about a wide array of solutions that were created to meet specific problems that young inventors encountered in their communities or in their studies. Uh, can you share some of the more memorable examples of ways inventors have gotten to know, uh, you've gotten to know, have changed the world around them for the better? Right, well, you gave me actually a toughie and I think it's actually a tough question because there's so many great examples and I've been incredibly privileged to work with so many different inventors over the course of my career. Um, but um, given that I come from the field of health and life sciences, I'm gonna pick one in that field to highlight. Um, as all of you probably know, I mean, a breakthrough discovery of the last century was the discovery that DNA was the common code of life for all organisms living on this planet. And that discovery, while groundbreaking, it, it actually left us unclear as to how we'd use that information until there were inventions that provided tools that allowed us to use the information productively. So let me pick one of those inventions that I was lucky enough to witness and sort of ride alongside with um, as I, uh, over the course of my career, and that's the invention of automated sequencing devices. So early in my career, as you mentioned, I was lucky enough to actually work at the National Institutes of Health where I worked on the Human Genome Project. And at that time, the Human Genome Project was considered like audacious, impossible, um, potentially not going to get done with the amount of money that they'd set aside for it. And the goal of that was really to sequence the first full sequences of a few model organisms, things like the mouse, which we use so, so productively in terms of learning about biology. 
um, but also the first human genome, and that was really daunting. So the hope was that we'd pick that sequence up and we'd be able to unlock the dictionary of our genetic code in a way that would allow us to advance medicine dramatically. So there had been ways to sequence DNA invented by that time, but they were slow and costly and they involved a lot of nasty chemicals, I speak from experience, and they were super labor intensive. So people joked, actually, it's kind of a sad joke, that it was gonna, to sequence the first genome, we would actually need like thousands of graduate students and postdocs who literally like that was all they did. They went in and they just sequenced every single day using radioactive chemicals and whatever. So in the late 1980s, the first automated DNA sequencer was invented by uh, Lee Hood and Lloyd Smith. And in the early 1990s, they received their first government uh, grants to actually test it and begin sequencing the human genome. And I was lucky enough to sit in those study sections and hear that conversation. And people really were arguing, well, this is not a safe bet. We need to go back to those postdocs and graduate students. But in fact, they turned out to be right. And inventing that sequencer changed and transformed the way we approached completing the human genome project. So from that sequencing, that transition of sequencing by hand to the automated sequencer, it actually allowed us to do the human genome project, genome project and complete it. But now we're actually able to complete whole sequences of genomes of plants, animals, any basic biologic organism. And we can do it at incredibly low cost. So the human genome project was thought to cost the first genome $100 million. Now you can sequence a genome for like $1,000 in the course of a day instead of over the course of decades. This has allowed us to speed up the discovery of drugs, vaccines. It's also been critical to identify pathogens. So for instance, coronavirus 19, COVID-19. And that information is absolutely critical to creating the vaccines we're gonna to need to go back to the life we all would like to be living at this point in time. It's also made it possible for us to actually think about drugs and treatments in a new way. So certain patients um, understanding their genetic makeup and tailoring those drugs and those, um, the delivery of those drugs to the people who could use them effectively. So basically it's transformed medicine and has huge potential to continue to do so. But the other thing is it's actually transformed virtually everything that's dependent on life sciences, whether it's agriculture, it's medicine, it's the health of the environment. But I could get caught up in this. You can see my excitement about it. It, it really has changed everything around life sciences. But I would say there are tons of amazing inventions as you look across fields, not just in life sciences, but across completely. Uh, and I just toss out there, think about photovoltaic cells and the panels we have now for renewable energy that actually hold the promise of completely infinite energy that we could use to drive the things we do um, in our world. So I would say um, lots of opportunity to witness inventions. And if you keep your eyes open, you have been witness to amazing inventions around you. And I'm so excited about the potential all of you have to create that next invention that I can tell a story about. So we have a lot of questions and I wished we could take more, but unfortunately we, we only have uh, time for one last question. And that is from Shreya Srinivasan, the curate graduate winner from MIT and it's for Director Yonku. Hi, um, thank you so much for um, talk. It, was, it was really, really nice. Um, the USPTO's recent study prepared in accordance with the Success Act, talked a lot about the economic benefits of um, owning a patent. Um, could you speak a little bit about the potential for patent holders to lift themselves up um, and maybe their families and communities by obtaining a patent, how that process would look like? Sure, thanks, Rhea. And um, uh, you're asking mainly about uh, the potential benefits of patents uh, to an individual or the community to lift themselves up. and. Um, it's critically important. Let me uh, address that in a second. Um, but um, Carol inspired me um, to address also the just the overall importance of the patent system uh, to the United States overall and to humanity. I want to just put some things in historical perspective. There were obviously humans have been on the planet for thousands and thousands or tens of thousands of years. Human civilization has been around for thousands and thousands of years. If you think back 
to the ancient Romans and Greeks and Chinese and the ancient Hebrews, uh, Aztecs, Mayans, on and on, to civilizations around the world for thousands of years. And then fast forward to the founding of this country in 1776. And think about the state of technology when this country was founded in 1776 after these thousands of years of human life and human civilization. Transportation was basically by horseback at the time. Anesthesia didn't exist. At best, it was a shot of whiskey. Um, communication, you know, you basically had to send Paul Revere again on horseback or send a carrier pigeon. And look at us now, just a couple of centuries later. You're talking transportation is now air and space flight. The state of medicine, we have personalized medicine, immunotherapies, cancer treatments, and the like. And communication, by gosh, instant communications around the world and meetings like this, who could have thought of them? And just in 200 years. So what's changed? What changed in this time? Did humans grow an extra brain in 1776? I think there were a lot of smart people around the world for many, many years. But there was one fundamental difference maker when this country was established. From an economic point of view, the, the democratization of the patent system, when it was recognized in the Constitution, in the Constitution itself, the word right is mentioned only once, and that's with respect to the clause I read earlier on with intellectual property rights. When it was recognized in the Constitution, the right of the individual, inventor or author, to their inventions. And for the first time, anyone could invent. You didn't have to be rich. You did not have to be friends with the crown. And the pace of innovation skyrocketed. So the meaning of the patent system, the critical importance of the patent system to humanity is untold. It is unparalleled as compared to anything else, in my view, in human history. And to your question directly, the importance to the individual, how the individual lifts themselves up. Well, Carol talked a bunch about that, so I don't want to repeat any of that, but personal benefits such as improved prestige, income, job-related opportunities. Patents also help the individuals and companies gain access to capital, financial capital, um, find licensees and facilitate growth. For instance, we have a study that uh, shows that startups, startups that receive a granted patent, show a growth in their employment in the first five years that is 55% higher than without uh, without that first patent. But most importantly, patents create a path for inventors to penetrate established markets and bring brand new solutions to the public. And then when you do that, that's when you've made a real difference. And some of you have already done that and you will continue to do that. And some of you may be even remembered like Thomas Edison and the Wright brothers as having changed the world. Thank you so much, Carol and, and, and Director Yonku. Um, very, very inspiring comments, students, very good questions. You know, normally we would get to see all of you in person at Eureka Fest. Typically uh, that would be at MIT. And this year we had grand plans to be in Washington, DC and all of you were going to be sharing your prototypes of your inventions at the Smithsonian, uh, at the Lumelson Center at the Smithsonian. And we were, we were very excited to do that, but uh, you know, 
uh, fate intervenes. So we appreciate that we can still uh, see you in person, Director, uh, via this technology. And um, if there's a silver lining in this cloud, it's that we've had 700 people watching live tonight and hearing from all of you. And uh, I'm sure they're as excited about all this great work as, as we are at the Lemelson MIT program. So many thanks to all of you. And um, this does bring our session to a close, our virtual Eureka Fest. But before we go, we want to thank all of our supporters who make our work possible and extend a very special thank you to the Eureka Fest sponsors of the Lemelson Foundation, Prasad Kathari, and Michael Seema and Tina Cortezi. So thank you so much um, for your uh, donations to our program and others um, who are listed for our year-round support. And then also, um, there are some special folks I'd like to thank who made this production possible. Uh, MIT Video Productions, the Lemelson MIT Master Teachers uh, who work with our various teams from uh, around the US, the Lemelson MIT Invent Team Judges who help us determine uh, who we will give, which high school teams to give grants to, uh, our Student Prize Screening Committee, our Lemelson MIT National Jury, uh, both of those uh, contributing to, to who we award the student prizes to. And then, of course, the Lemelson MIT staff, uh, all the staff, uh, but a, a lot of work, of course, by uh, Betsy Boyle, our uh, manager of finance and administration. Um, a reminder that you can learn more about this year's invent teams and student prize winners by heading to eurekafast.org to watch the videos they produced about their inventions. And um, I think you'll be as impressed as I am each year. Uh, it's, it's just really exciting to see the next generation of inventors and leading innovators. So with that, uh, thank you all. Have a good evening.